appreciate the, the, the invitation and the regret the, the rescheduling, uh, but it's really a pleasure to uh, engage this audience and uh, uh, Pat in particular, because uh, I think we do share a lot of uh, certainly values and, and uh, principles of uh, how we're hoping to uh, turn discovery into the health of the nation and share very briefly uh, some of the things that we're doing at NHLBI that hopefully resonates uh, with a lot of your strategic directions. I'll try to split it up in a couple of different chunks, one about our role as accountable stewards and you know, what we're doing in the strategic planning and visioning uh, sort of process, and uh, where we think there might be some scientific opportunities that, uh, again, uh, our two institutes might share. Clearly what we share is uh, the mission uh, to turn discovery into to health and uh, as we've tried to develop our planning structure, is this working okay? Um, we've been driven by uh, a few uh, enduring principles. Sounds like I have a short or something. Okay, that's working more consistently, good. Um, uh, the first of which is really to, to, to value investigator-initiated fundamental discovery science is really a bedrock uh, for us, and uh, uh, one in which uh, actually um, those of you around this table uh, are the principal means by which we fulfill our mission. Uh, the second element that's important, particularly I think uh, for our institute, is to maintain a balanced uh, portfolio, one that uh, crosses disciplines and uh, uh, spans the spectrum of basic, translational, clinical, and population science. Um, and uh, I think that's provide a, a, a great legacy over the 65 plus years of, of um, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, another area of passion uh, relates to training a diverse uh, next generation of scientific leaders. And so uh, I believe this is one of our most sacrosanct uh, elements of our mission. Um, and we're looking forward to ongoing opportunities to pursue that uh, in collaboration. Um, and then the last two uh, are ones of particular uh, priority uh, that often um, uh, has not come to the fore. And one is to support implementation science that empowers patients uh, and enables partners uh, to improve the health of the nation. Uh, and one in which, uh, uh, again, I think there may be some overlap uh, with NINR. And then finally, um, a key one for me personally is to innovate in evidence-based elimination of health inequities uh, in this country and, and around the world. And so these are some of the enduring principles that as we, we go forward uh, with our strategic plan and its implementation that uh, we continue to come back to as touchstones. Uh, and uh, we also have been engaged in this process uh, that we call strategic visioning. Uh, we, we put a couple of twists on it uh, compared to uh, uh, previous iteration uh, by my predecessor uh, in which uh, uh, we try to uh, expand the inclusiveness uh, and the diversity of, of perspectives um, that were brought to bear uh, and leveraged uh, the, the, the crowd, if you will, some crowdsourcing uh, technology uh, to engage uh, individuals in, in helping us come up with what are the most compelling questions and critical challenges uh, that uh, could inform our research agenda over the next uh, five to ten years. And uh, along sort of four sort of dimensions in, of goals uh, to understand human biology, uh, to reduce uh, human disease, uh, to really accelerate um, uh, translational uh, research, uh, and uh, to develop the workforce uh, of the future uh, and its resources. Uh, this yielded uh, a total of 1,234. You could make up that number. Um, of compelling questions and, and critical challenges that sort of bubbled up uh, along the way. Uh, every state uh, in the union uh, participated, as well as 42 countries around the world. Uh, uh, and so this was a, an engagement of, 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 of thousands, uh, as well as organizations uh, from, from every constituency. Uh, and as we've uh, sifted this uh, with our advisory council uh, and its working groups, um, uh, sort of eight overarching objectives emerged, and I won't detail them, but uh, uh, they're listed here that again cover, I think, uh, a fair spectrum of, of areas and themes uh, that again will guide us as we look uh, toward our institute-solicited uh, portfolio 
and I think in many ways will complement what comes in through the investigator-initiated uh, pool as well uh, as, as, as sort of guideposts uh, as we develop and implement uh, this strategic vision moving forward. Um, amongst the things that uh, have bubbled up that uh, hopefully resonates, uh, particularly around this space, uh, in this case of understanding uh, normal biological function, uh, as really a, a means of um, starting to understand uh, resilience and, and wellness. What, what, what are the processes uh, that sustain and maintain us in a sort of normal homeostasis and um, actually may promote resistance uh, to disease and, and aging uh, as part of our portfolio? And as we understand uh, what sustains uh, normality and, and wellness, uh, gain greater insight into how we can preserve that and uh, more effective preventive uh, and, and health maintenance sort of strategies, um, as well as uh, understanding the intrinsic reparative capacity uh, of the body uh, to sustain health um, and, and do so in a more uh, robust way. Uh, similarly, um, uh, another th uh, sort of area that emerged that um, potentially could have major impact uh, is to move from uh, our portfolio, which intrinsically deals with uh, the symptomatic uh, end stage of heart, lung, blood, uh, and sleep disorders uh, to thinking about intervening earlier in the process uh, in ways that don't accept the progressive inexorable decline uh, to dysfunction and death uh, that is so much part of these chronic diseases of aging, if you will, and, and to indeed not accept them as inevitable parts of aging, but to think of the notion that we could actually stop some of these disorders in their tracks, that uh, we could be more like our oncology colleagues and start to talk about the remission of coronary heart disease as a cardiologist uh, who's actually on medications uh, to, to uh, uh, reduce that progression. I, I'd love for us to uh, have an agenda that actually seeks to, to, to induce the remission uh, and this notion of preempting disease uh, and, and doing so by, again, uh, perhaps even innervating before uh, symptoms and, and clinical manifestations uh, are, are so um, debilitating. Uh, that we can hit that sweet spot of transition. And in order to do that, we have to enhance our ability to both prognosticate and have uh, a new generation of biomarkers that can indeed uh, uh, signal and um, uh, demarcate that transition from normal uh, to disease. So those are some of the uh, elements that uh, bubbled up from that process that really sort of set out um, uh, some, some targets uh, a potential impact uh, that we hope to make over the next decade. Uh, obviously, in order to do that, uh, we have to, to manage within our appropriation. Uh, and so we've been uh, steadfast at trying to be, again, accountable stewards, uh, in, even in an era of, of flat budgets, uh, make data-guided priority decisions. Uh, and in accordance with that first enduring principle, we've tried to execute on that uh, by really prioritizing um, our R01 pool. And uh, when I came in in 2012, uh, we had been on this uh, declining path of success rates and the number of awards we were giving the R01s. Uh, and we've made a, a diligent effort to, uh, to bend that curve and again, increase the proportion uh, and number of our investigator initiated awards, uh, in, uh, increasing from the nadir of 10% to the 14th percentile. Uh, and we'll be uh, at that perhaps in a little bit higher uh, here in fiscal year 16. In addition, uh, we've had uh, a, a policy that's been in place since uh, my predecessor, Betsy Nagel, was here, where we give a 10% uh, handicap uh, to early stage investigators uh, at the 24th percentile. I think I'm shorting out here, uh, in which uh, those investigators uh, uh, can be funded at the 24th percentile. And so uh, with that, uh, we've also, in, in keeping with the enduring principle, uh, have um, buttressed our uh, nurturing of the next generation, uh, which uh, a major consideration for us is uh, building out the diversity, uh, building out uh, from the Common Fund uh, program, the BUILD and uh, the National Minority uh, um, Network, Norman uh, program, as well as our own programs, uh, the R25s, Pride program, diversity supplements, uh, diversity K awards, which we give uh, to, again, increase the representation of underrepresented groups within the biomedical workforce. 
Um, we've also uh, um, tried to, uh, again, bend the curve uh, in um, the uh, Career Development Awards. Uh, that also had a declining success rate uh, during the previous five years. And we've tried to bend that around uh, to have success rates for our Ks now in the high 30s uh, to 40. I already mentioned that the 10 percentile uh, bonus we give our early stage investigators for our R01 success rates, which are now uh, hovering in the mid to high 20s. Uh, in addition, we instituted an R56 uh, bridge award, a sort of one-year grant just uh, administratively uh, awarded if uh, an ESI uh, misses that 24th percentile but comes in, say, 26 or 27, uh, we can make them eligible for an R56, which will give them one year of that R01 proposal and provide them uh, with a kind of capital infusion to their startup package to, and enable them to, to get their preliminary data such that they can reapply. And we've seen uh, preliminarily some very good conversion rates as they bridge uh, to their first R01 grant. Uh, and uh, we've increased our investment in the loan repayment program, something I think is still underutilized uh, with success rates uh, over 50 percent uh, at our place. And then finally, um, two uh, new um, released initiatives, one in which we leverage the uh, K awardees, which uh, already uh, is enriched in um, uh, investigators that show great promise and likelihood of converting uh, to an R01 eventually. We see that as kind of the seed corn of, uh, uh, of uh, the future. Uh, and uh, But we recognize there's a chasm between the K and the R with a substantial period of time. So we've created an R award that's a limited competition just for the K awardees uh, in which they can get sort of uh, some preliminary data uh, that will help them uh, as they develop their ESI or R1 uh, and uh, transition more seamlessly from K to R. And then finally, uh, uh, a, a new award mechanism that uh, um, funds uh, people and programs as opposed to projects, the R35, uh, and we've created a category just for what we're calling emerging investigators, those who've gotten an ESI but also often struggle uh, at that mid-career stage to become sustained uh, awardees, uh, picking those and, and, and giving them sustained funding up to seven years and up to uh, $600,000 uh, per year uh, to really uh, launch them as long-term uh, part of our future investigator base. So those are a few of the programmatic things uh, that we're doing. Uh, let me pivot now to... Uh, some of the scientific opportunities. And uh, in that regard, uh, uh, I've inherited uh, uh, really a, a legacy of excellence uh, in terms of the um, success uh, that uh, I think is derived in large part uh, to the investments in biomedical research in which you see this 70% uh, drop in um, heart disease deaths over the last 50 years or so. Uh, obviously, this relates to some of the observations about the etiology of heart disease, uh, for example, the impact of cigarette smoking, uh, public health interventions uh, that have um, reduced um, the, the prevalence of that uh, habit uh, and that exposure, uh, as well as advances in, in medical care uh, and uh, interventions uh, that have uh, contributed uh, in a major way. Uh, and so this is, I think, one of the uh, good success stories for NIH, uh, one that we continue to want to, to advance and, and bend that curve. Uh, we do also appreciate, though, that uh, that aggregate uh, benefit has not been achieved in, in every community uh, across the nation. This is just a recent uh, JAMA article I'm sure many of you saw uh, that looked at the heterogeneity uh, by socioeconomic status uh, and geography. Uh, as we look at, in this case, life expectancy of the uh, indice of morbidity, mortality, and health uh, inequities, uh, in which you can see this, uh, this heterogeneous process and really reminds us that we still have unfinished business to ensure that discovery uh, enhances the health of all Americans uh, as we pursue this. Uh, in this regard, addressing uh, health inequities, we believe, is uh, clearly a complex uh, multi-level problem uh, that gives you that sort of um, heterogeneity by um, uh, class and geography. 
Um, but uh, we're also uh, optimistic uh, that we may have the tools at hand with a more systems approach to tackle these com complex problems. Uh, certainly, biology is embracing complexity increasingly uh, with the systems biology approach in which uh, beyond reducing things to one molecule, um, we're starting to understand uh, biology in terms of networks in an integrative kind of way. Uh, Pat, that's part of old uh, physiology as we studied it, uh, but now it's been reinvented uh, in systems and integrative biology. Uh, but uh, in many ways that resonates with what social scientists have been dealing with in their social ecological model. Uh, and these different uh, framing and convergence of a systems approach, I think, uh, provides an opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to make an impact in the space of, of health inequities. Uh, in that regard, I, I think there are, are commonalities uh, uh, for NHLBI and NINR uh, where a system approach uh, at a multi-level uh, way uh, may be consonant with uh, how we can have an impact uh, on on patients uh, and uh, by uh, in, empowering uh, a more patient-centered approach uh, that leverages uh, the entire uh, care team, uh, including those embedded within the community, uh, perhaps community health workers as well, uh, pharmacists, uh, community organizations, um, resources that are in the community like schools uh, as a, a total ecosystem uh, to help patients uh, both self-manage uh, and uh, indeed uh, promote health. Uh, and so it's with this uh, broader uh, ecological frame uh, that I think we have an opportunity to continue that sort of translational um, uh, pathway, uh, one that uh, goes from discovery, uh, but, but goes also not only uh, through efficacy, but also toward effectiveness and, and really impact uh, in real world settings um, uh, where patients uh, live, work, and play and are cared for. And I think there's increasingly opportunities to enhance that T4 uh, research agenda uh, and implementation science. Um, it, one of the potential exemplars uh, relates to a common area uh, of hypertension for the NHLBI, one where, uh, again, there's a very proud legacy of, of um, uh, practice changing uh, clinical efficacy trials going back to, to, to SHEP uh, in terms of systolic blood pressure, all had in terms of this, the treatment strategies and medication choices, um, affirming the, import, uh, the, the, the efficacy of diuretics in that, in that space, Accord, looking at certain high-risk populations like diabetics. Uh, and most recently, the SPRINT study, uh, the SPRINT trial, uh, showing that a more aggressive, intensive uh, treatment strategy down to a target uh, less than 120 over 80 um, uh, had a greater efficacy than uh, the usual care uh, but based on guidelines of a 140 target uh, in reducing cardiovascular events like heart failure, heart attack, strokes uh, by a substantial um, uh, proportion of over 20%, as well as reducing death uh, by 25%. Uh, and so clearly, uh, this is, I think, a, a landmark study uh, that has a lot of implications um, for our patients and our uh, public health. And it uh, raises the question of, of um, w what we do after these practice transforming trials uh, and how we might be able to, to Im implement uh, and disseminate uh, this new uh, information into evidence-based care that reaches, again, all communities in a way uh, that everyone benefits uh, from the fruits of this discovery. Uh, in that regard, uh, we've uh, partnered uh, with PCORI uh, in this context to, to look and test uh, different uh, research strategies and intervention strategies uh, that it might improve blood pressure control uh, in particularly high-risk groups, uh, minority, low socioeconomic status, and or rural populations. And so uh, this is a collaborative effort uh, in which we're hoping to be sure that uh, we don't stop at, at, at efficacy and discovery, uh, but we make sure that it does indeed affect the health of the nation and all Americans benefit uh, from that discovery. I think this is also an area where, uh, again, uh, of this convergence of uh, system science uh, and the uh, socio-ecological model uh, in which uh, we can address health inequities, uh, as shown on the left there, the high uh, incidence of, of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease failure amongst African-Americans in the red there, the highest curve Native Americans are next. 
uh, and uh, understanding uh, the drivers of this process often relate to hypertension and diabetes, uh, but uh, understanding why indeed certain ancestral groups are predisposed. Uh, and this is where um, the, the revolution in, in omic technologies uh, uh, may be coming to the fore. We now appreciate uh, that um, an African-American like myself uh, has a, a genome that looks like a mosaic. Uh, this is uh, uh, the work of uh, Carlos Bustamante, and by chromosome by chromosome, I may have uh, an admixture of, of variation that uh, is influenced not only by my African ancestry, um, uh, but also a European admixture, perhaps even Native American uh, elements, and all that uh, influences a, a predisposition. That genome uh, was really shaped um, uh, over um, uh, centuries, uh, particularly related to the uh, particular uh, population history of African Americans uh, uh, derived from the slave trade uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, and exposure uh, to the exposome uh, of that time and period. Uh, in this case, uh, where uh, an infectious vector like malaria uh, could clearly shape our, our genome in ways that produces um, entities like sickle cell or the Duffy antigen, G6PD deficiency, are again disproportionately represented uh, in our population. And we're intrigued uh, by uh, observations uh, like this landmark one by Genovese et al. related to the APOL1 gene. Uh, in which it mixed your analysis of African-American families, uh, all of whom uh, were, had end-stage kidney disease, uh, revealed uh, a risk variant, the APOL1, uh, that conferred a, a several-fold increased risk of chronic kidney disease in, the, in this patient population. It's been replicated in a number of different studies uh, and indeed uh, is one of the more potent um, genetic risk factors that's been uh, described. Uh, and again, uh, the ancestral history um, really tells something because uh, the variant, this risk variant for chronic kidney disease is actually protective uh, because it kills uh, a parasite, the trypanosome, uh, that causes African sleeping sickness uh, and the cerebral vasculopathy that occurs in that context. And so that's why as a select, positive selection uh, for this to be actually fairly prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa and probably 10% of the African-American population in this country. And so uh, in the context outside of the trypanosome in sub-Saharan where you have um, uh, this this parasite um, um, protection. Uh, now, if you fast forward a few hundred years uh, to uh, um, the United States, where uh, the, probably the biggest killer is uh, um, you know the fast food industry, uh, where you're consuming all this salt and and fat, and African Americans now have that risk allele plus hypertension. You can now see why that curve uh, is is bending upward uh, at a. a, a a faster rate for African Americans. And so this insight, uh, we believe, has implications for um, uh, this new era of precision medicine in which we have prognostic uh, understanding of what may be some of the drivers of health inequities and uh, refine our capacity for risk prediction, uh, perhaps influence our treatment strategies. Uh, and uh, as we learn more about the biology, the fact that APOL1 is actually expressed in the endothelium and the smooth muscle cells uh, within the blood vessels, that it may be a systemic vasculopathy that these individuals are predisposed to, we may start to understand the pathways that drive the development of progressive uh, kidney disease that's not only relevant to African Americans, but, but, but all Americans. And so uh, it could reveal downstream uh, targets for new therapies. So we're excited about the potential uh, to do that linkage of both um, areas of translation that, again, span from discovery all the way to implementation science. Not only true for uh, cardiovascular disease, but uh, we believe it's relevant to our, our blood disease portfolio, uh, certainly in the area of sickle cell disease, uh, where uh, we've uh, um, put through a number of programmatic elements that are, again, uh, uh, stimulating discovery science, uh, in particular, the, the pathways that predispose to the pleiotropic manifestation. Why is it that that one mutation that we've known about for 70 years now um, uh, also lead to some individuals who have stroke, some individuals who have kidney disease with sickle, uh, some who have cardiopulmonary complications, uh, and yet we don't really understand who will get what. Uh, and so I think there's opportunities for us to, to pursue that. 
Uh, but as we continue to advance that, we're also excited about uh, the new tools of, of uh, gene editing, the capacity to actually fix molecular defects, uh, and the opportunity to actually consider uh, curing sickle cell disease. Those are the things that we see on the horizon. Um, but until those things on the horizon uh, come to pass, uh, ensuring that the things that we know that work, um, the efficacy trials that the NHLBI has funded that show that hydroxyurea can prevent uh, a number of the complications, uh, we're dismayed that still there are patients who aren't on evidence-based therapy. And so we have some implementation science work to do as well in this space. Uh, and so that's where, again, this balanced portfolio is critically important uh, as part of that. And uh, indeed, we have a recent initiative uh, just focused in on that last leg of the journey of implementation science uh, to see if we can establish uh, uh, multi-level model strategies uh, to enhance um, health outcomes for patients with sickle cell disease. Now, uh, I've learned in, in my time as a NHLBI director that um, even though I'm a cardiologist, I have to be a ecumenical uh, in, in our, our portfolio. So uh, I've given you heart. I've given you blood. I, I can't uh, miss lung. And just wanted to give you an example uh, of, of asthma, uh, where, again, we've seen um, uh, a disproportionate burden in this case of uh, emergency room uh, visits and hospitalizations for African-American and Latino children. Uh, and uh, here is a, a disorder uh, in which uh, treatment, uh, effective treatment, shouldn't really result in, in uh, emergency room visits or hospitalizations. Uh, and so uh, clearly this is an area where we have things where we've shown efficacy, uh, but where we can probably make an impact, particularly in certain communities. Uh, it's also illustrative of an area where um, a, a sort of patient-centered approach uh, could be very effective, one where um, uh, symptom and, and self-management uh, plays a key role. And I know that's a, a big part of the NI, in our uh, research agenda, uh, one in which uh, we should be able to surround that child uh, with uh, the means uh, to sustain and control uh, their disease, uh, and one where um, their exposures uh, are, are critical uh, factors, uh, but those are also ones that uh, uh, could potentially be, be modified or, or they could be protected from. Uh, and this is an area where, again, thinking about different sorts of strategies that obviously recognizes genetic susceptibility, but also uh, influences other uh, factors uh, that may play a role in their disease morbidity, uh, that we start to, to imagine um, a, a diff different sorts of strategies that lever leverage a, a lot of the, the, the growing capabilities uh, in which we can discover mediators and biomarkers uh, of disease uh, processes um, to, to uh, again, drive a more patient-centered approach uh, to asthma control. Uh, we now have uh, tools and technologies that uh, uh, each of you has in your pocket. Uh, clearly, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, this can measure my heart rate, my blood pressure, my sleep wake cycle. If I take a picture of my supper, could uh, calculate the calories. You probably noticed a little black band around my wrist that's counting my steps. And I'm way behind this morning already. Um, <laughs> Uh, it could send me a reminder, uh, which it often does, that I am behind my, my, my step count for the day. Uh, and that uh, uh, it, it, it could also remind that asthmatic uh, to take their controlled medicine. In fact, uh, the apps are being developed that if you <laughs> blow into the microphone, it could figure out your FEV1. And so uh, as well as the, uh, the air quality of the, of the environment that you're walking or driving or going to school in. Uh, and so we, we're entering a new uh, digital age of, of biomedicine in which uh, uh, our engagement of patients is not limited to those clinic visit snapshots, uh, but literally it's, it's a running movie of, of real-time data collection uh, in which uh, uh, the patient uh, is a data generator, uh, could be a data analyst, um, as well as a key actor uh, in terms of they're using that data to enhance their health. And I think these are areas where, again, there are opportunities for uh, uh, our institutes to collaborate. Uh, we're starting to imagine this systems approach 
in which uh, we take advantage of this sort of common wealth of data, as I call it, uh, at multiple levels of, of characterizing uh, the built environment uh, of, the, of the patient, uh, their, their nutrition, their physical activity, their geography, uh, their engagement uh, in the healthcare system, a whole new uh, taxonomy, if you will, of understanding clinical phenotypes and, and symptoms, uh, and one where you can now superimpose uh, imaging and omics uh, to, again, uh, link it to biological pathways. Uh, it is this integration uh, that I think uh, is part of what we see uh, on the horizon uh, as we deal with chronic disease and indeed uh, a multiplicity of chronic diseases and thinking about how best to intervene. Um, in that regard, uh, we are uh, pursuing um, the notion of uh, enabling data collection uh, that facilitates uh, various cohorts uh, that may be embedded within health systems, certainly for the heart, lung, uh, blood, sleep part of our portfolio uh, that uh, then could be uh, um, subjects for uh, applied analytics uh, that would further characterize both their disease susceptibility, risk, and prognosis. Uh, and then um, where we might launch uh, interventional trials uh, based on that uh, phenotype in ways that could then track follow-up and outcome and management. Uh, and we see this as a future uh, that is before us uh, and is part of what engendered the, the development of our top med program, Transomics for Precision Medicine, in which we're starting with uh, our cohorts uh, famous iconic ones like uh, Framingham, but inclusive of a, a number of other cohorts of over uh, 200,000 individuals uh, collectively in which we're layering this deep phenotyping uh, and omic technologies uh, to further characterize heart, lung, blood, and sleep uh, disorders uh, from everything on the omic level uh, to, again, understanding their exposome and environmental and behavioral uh, and social determinants as well. Uh, we're making uh, progress. Uh, this just shows you a pie chart of the various uh, phenotypes that we've captured. Uh, and uh, we've been very intentional uh, because a lot of the uh, omic resources have been, I'll say, a bit Eurocentric, uh, that uh, we want to be sure to leverage uh, uh, the diversity of uh, our cohorts and, and expand um, the diversity of genomic resources as a way of understanding um, uh, health and disease in the entire human family. Uh, and this is an effort that uh, now puts us up over 60,000 whole genomes uh, that we've created as a, a novel uh, genomic resource. Uh, and uh, we see this as uh, creating uh, this uh, uh, element uh, that will link uh, both the exposome uh, omics uh, and uh, in, a, in a data commons uh, that we hope will enrich our understanding of health and disease and perhaps serve uh, as one of the platforms uh, by which our two ICs uh, can interact and collaborate. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Gary. We have a few minutes for questions, if uh, you're open for them. Mm -hmm. uh, please, any questions for uh, Dr. Gibbons? This is your opportunity to find a little bit more about what's going on in NHLBI and some of the areas that might be of interest to you. I have a question. So, um, Historically, critical care has been an important part of your portfolio as well. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, again, it was, it's hard, hard to be both ecumenical and comprehensive uh, with our portfolio. So, yes, there are uh, elements of critical care, uh, certainly uh, things about um, acute lung injury. Um, we have a whole network that's really uh, in that space of, of understanding um, uh, things in that critical care uh, context, um, and even uh, some of the things that uh, we've been discussing in terms of prognostic and biomarker things of, of outcome. Uh, but uh, uh, again, that's a, a very important element uh, of this um, uh, pedal uh, being one of the, the, the network programs that's in this space. 
you didn't actually mention anything about sleep, Gary, and I wondered if you... <laughs> I know you're... I, I, here we are, not allowing you to be uh, ecumenical or at least inclusive, but did you have any anything as you're moving forward, any particular issues that are... Uh, pressing or burning. Yeah, area. no. The, again, it. it uh, I was trying to uh, not take your entire mo- morning and afternoon, uh, but um, uh, sleep it, we see as a, a cross-cutting area. As as you're aware, it actually truly spans heart, lung, and blood, uh, and clearly has its own entity. We're doing uh, efficacy trials in spaces like sleep apnea, both in adults and children. Uh, uh, it, uh, there's. Uh, as part of that top med uh, program, uh, understanding uh, potential uh, susceptibility, um, uh, genetic factors and biomarkers uh, in that space. So sleep is also included. Um, uh, clearly you're aware of all the epidemiologic work that uh, relates uh, uh, sleep quality and duration to cardiovascular disease. So our cohort studies are very engaged in that. We already le- talked about the technologies that are enabling us to, to look at sleep-wake cycle now, now potentially in tens of thousands of places. Uh, we're doing some collaborations with um, uh, child health in, in, in women who are pregnant, actually. Uh, and so um, I must admit as a, uh, a husband and father of three uh, that uh, you can imagine, you know, uh, with pregnancy, there is actually a fairly high prevalence of sleep disorder breathing uh, and uh, uh, with those changes in habitus and physiology. And we're not sure what that does to the fetus, uh, what that may do long term postpartum. And so we're very interested in, in tracking cohorts uh, of, of pregnant women. And through that process, we're actually debating uh, about, uh, for the mild cases, uh, the treatment uh, and thinking about an intervention trial in that context. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, some equipoise challenges uh, in thinking about that ethically. But yeah, there's, there's a, a lot. We're working with um, DDK uh, on, on changes in sleep wake related to weight loss and bariatric surgery. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, activity in the sleep space for sure. Thank you. I had the opportunity to uh, go to one of your seminars last week. David Dinges was presenting, and by the time I finished uh, hearing about uh, the various aspects of how bad it was not to get enough sleep, I was feeling a little defensive. <laughs> <laughs> so did you take a nap during the... the <laughs> no, I, I felt like I, he deserved it, but I didn't. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This was very uh, enlightening, and we appreciate that you did be that you were ecumenical, but also pretty inclusive. Okay, and we thank do look you. Forward to those Thanks for having us here. Thank you so much. Thank you.